So we're going to be solving the 2020 multiple choice British Physics Olympiad intermediate challenge today. Just a little note that these are not official solutions and please check out the British Physics Olympiad's website. Okay, so question one, we have a student that measures the density of water by determining the mass and volume of seven different quantities of water. The student then plots the measured values of mass and volume on a graph. How should the student determine the density of water from the graph? So we're looking for density, and density is often given this symbol here. It's like a curly uh, P, which is the Greek letter rho. And this is defined as mass over volume. So this means that if I had a graph with the mass on the y-axis and the volume on the x-axis, then the gradient of that graph will be defined as change in mass divided by change in volume and this here will be equal to the density so the correct answer is c another way to think about this i'm uh, just going to give you one more way is to rearrange this equation for m so i'm just going to do this down here so mass is equal to density times volume and we can compare this to the graph of y is equal to mx plus c this is the equation of a straight line and if m is on the y-axis if v is on the x-axis the graph will be a straight line through the origin and what's left for the gradient is the density okay question two we have a light ray from a ray box that can be used to demonstrate refraction when the light ray passes from the air into the glass the light ray is refracted towards the normal which of the statements is not a valid explanation for refraction so A, the frequency of the light changes as it enters the glass. Well, the first one, we're quite lucky, is definitely not correct. The frequency of the light always remains the same. It is the wavelength that changes. So wavelength changes during refraction, but frequency is constant. So in this case, A is the statement which is not valid and our correct answer. Okay, question three, we have a car starts from rest and accelerates down a slope. The acceleration remains constant as the car travels from the top to the bottom of the slope. The average speed of the car is two meters per second. The speed of the car as it approaches the bottom of the slope is now this is a really tricky question and what we can remember and i will explain why in a moment is that if the acceleration remains constant which it does in this case then the final speed let's call it v final is equal to exactly twice the average speed this makes the correct answer to be e four meters per second but why does it actually do this if you're taking this competition you're probably a very curious physicist let's explain why now when we're dealing with constant accelerations we can use a couple of equations which i'm going to write down First of all, let's say that our acceleration is equal to the final velocity v, take away the initial velocity u, divided by t. We can rearrange this equation for the final velocity v, and also given that u, the initial velocity, is actually zero, we know that u is equal to zero because the car starts from rest. So this guy here, u, is just zero. And this means that our final speed v is just equal to a times t. Now, we also know that the average speed, um, which uh, I've given this as average v up here in this equation, I'm going to write this as just v uh, average. And this is just equal to the total distance that you traveled. Let's call that, I don't know, s divided by t. So this distance s is basically just the length of the slope. So 
let's write down yet another equation that links them all together. Some of you guys may have seen this at GCSE already, and that is that v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as, where v is the final speed, u is the initial velocity, and s is the distance that's been traveled, and a is the acceleration. So first of all, I'm just going to simplify it. I'm going to say that v squared is equal to 2as because the initial speed u is equal to 0. Now, using this first equation, we can say that s, the distance, will be equal to v average multiplied by the time. So we can plug this in here. We're going to get that v squared will be equal to twice the acceleration. And rather than s, I'm going to multiply by v average times the time. But hang on a minute, this equation up here tells me that the acceleration is just v divided by t. So I'm going to say, I'm just going to carry on up here that v squared is equal to 2. And now rather than a, I'm going to write v over t. And then I'm going to multiply by v average times t. Notice a couple of things. First of all, the t's are going to cancel. One of those v's are going to cancel. And what we're left with is that v, the final velocity, is twice the average velocity. And that's why the correct answer is e. You don't have to remember this derivation, but I wanted to show you why is this result that your final velocity is twice the average velocity. Okay, question four. We have a battery and two identical bulbs are connected in parallel. The current through each bulb is 2 amps and the potential difference across each bulb is 12 volts. The, bat the battery voltage and the current through the battery are... So all of these components are in par parallel, meaning that the PD will be the same. So this one here will be 12 volts. This also means that our battery is going to be at 12 volts. Now the current though is going to split and if the bulbs are identical, they're going to have the same current that runs through them, which is 2 amps. Now through the battery though, we're going to have 2 amps going through here, but then also 2 amps going through there. So overall in this part of the circuit, we are going to have 4 amps in total, meaning that the correct answer is going to be D. Okay, next on question five, the specific heat capacity of copper is 385 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius, Celsius, which means that 385 joules of thermal energy are needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of copper by one degree Celsius. Then we're given the melting point. How much thermal energy is, to ra is needed to raise 50 grams of copper wire to its melting point when it's initially at the room temperature of 20 degrees C. Okay, so the equation that we're dealing with in this case is that E is equal to MC multiplied by our change in temperature. Now, the mass in this equation is in kilograms, so the way we're going to convert from grams to kilograms, because we're given 50 grams here, will be 50, and then to convert to kilograms, we're gonna need to divide by a thousand. Uh, I'm gonna multiply that by the specific latent, uh, the specific heat capacity, sorry, which is 385. And then by the change in temperature, which is equal to the final temperature, which is 1085 degrees Celsius, take away the initial one, which is 20. Putting that into a calculator, we're going to get 20,500 or so. And um, this means that the correct answer is D. Okay, next one. An electromagnet, is, an electromagnet is formed when a current flows 
through a coil of a wire. Which of the following changes on its own does not necessarily increase the strength of the electromagnet? So A, using a thicker wire. Well, this does not actually change it, but let's also explain why the other results do change it. Using a higher current, yep, absolutely this does change it. Adding an iron core, this absolutely does help link the magnetic fluxes using more turns of a wire this absolutely has a major effect making turns more tightly packed that is absolutely true as well so the thickness of the wire does not increase the strength of the electromagnet Okay, next one, question seven. A student measures the mass and acceleration of a trolley and calculates the resultant force. The mass of the trolley was measured to be 0.984 kilograms and the acceleration was determined to be 1.2 meters per second. And the student correctly calculates the resultant force to be equal to that number. The force should be recorded as. So we're going to be recording this to the lowest number of significant figures that were given in any of the quantities. So this one here is given to three significant figures, for instance. However, this number here was only given to two sig figs. And if that's the case, we can only trust our final result up to two significant figures. Therefore, the correct answer is B. Okay, question eight. A student predicts that a steel ball dropped from rest from a height of two meters will hit the floor after 0.63 seconds. In their calculation, they used an approximate value for the acceleration due to gravity to be 10 meters per second per second, and the accepted value is around 9.8. This means that their calculated time will be well, if they if their acceleration that they've chosen is larger, this means that the time will be too short. So the correct answer will either be C or E. Now, too short by around 0.2 seconds, this is really significant because our answer is 0.63. So we can immediately tell that this will be too short by around 1%. So the correct answer will be C. Okay, question nine. A firework uses a chemical reaction to create a thrust of force. The thrust does work on the rocket to change the velocity and height above the ground. Ignoring air resistance, the relationship between the work done, the thrust force and the change in kinetic energy and the change in gravitational potential energy of the rocket is... Well, the theorem or the equation that we're going to be using is that the work done is equal to the change of energy. Now, when the rocket was just on the ground, imagine the rocket is just this box here. Um, it had no kinetic energy and it had no potential energy, mgh, that, that's also equal to zero. But if the rocket is, you know, flying upwards, then it's going to have some kinetic energy and it's going to have some potential energy or written as GPE. Therefore, the work done will be equal to the change of energy. So now it's moving. So there's going to be a change in kinetic energy and it's also at a height H above the ground. So for that, we're going to need to add the potential energy as well, GPE. And which expression does that correspond to? That would be C. Question 10. A physics trolley starts from rest and has a constant acceleration. Well, given the velocity time graph is linear as shown. Okay, here's a linear graph. The corresponding graph of the velocity against displacement is, and we have the following choices. This here is a really good question. So the equation that links them together is that V squared is equal to U squared plus 2AS, where S is the displacement. Now, because the question says that it starts from rest, we can just ignore U squared, meaning that V will be equal to, or V squared will be equal to 2AS. The acceleration is constant as well. So what we're going to do is I'm going to square root 
with this. So V will be equal to the square root of 2AS. Now in maths, you've probably seen that Y is equal to the square root of X has a shape that is similar to this one here. And D is the correct answer because it's just a square root graph where our X, if you will, is just 2AS. Okay guys, so hopefully this uh, video has been very very useful for you. I've also filmed the entire GCSC specification. Feel free to browse through my channel and you can get started as well with this video of some more Olympiad multiple choice questions to ensure that you get the best grade right over here.